Reminds me like Viktor Frankl uh, uh, was able to survive. He was uh, put his mind in, in the, uh, and he was a psychiatrist in, into the mindset of looking past the degradation, the day to day, and found some meaning in his life by, uh, with a little scrap here and there, and burying yeah, an entire book and a, a, a new uh, wave of uh, Viennese uh, psychology. Uh, and these people aren't anywhere near him. It seems like they're doing the same thing. Uh, is, do you see some similarity there? So yes, I do. I, and I think that Marianka is, I think she nailed it when she said that it kept her whole. Um, and I think that she's quite right to fight against a, senti a sentimentalization. It did not save me. I could have died, but it is what kept me whole. Uh, you mentioned the variety of uh, musical groups that uh, were formed in the camp. Were these instruments that they had pilfered in, in or were they allowed to bring them into the camp? Uh, and the Germans overlooked the fact that the, they had these when they entered, or they, they were hidden? Um, the instruments were smuggled in. Uh, so were uh, supplies. All kinds of artistic supplies were smuggled in. Once the Germans allowed these kinds of these cultural activities, um, it's a really mixed story. So once the Germans allowed it, then non-Jews outside could send packages to family members and friends, and they could include scores, artistic supplies, but it was, as I say, mixed, because for no reason whatsoever, even though one never knew if it needed to be hidden in the package or whether it could just come through in a regular way. Now, having said this, I also want to tell you that this, this is a place with so many contradictions. And one of them is that there was a fantastic library in Theresienstadt. The Germans shipped in books from private Jewish libraries. And as you know, upper middle class people and certainly wealthy people had their private libraries. So the, these are robbed Jewish libraries, sent the books to Theresienstadt. So in fact, Theresienstadt had the richest collection of forbidden works of any library in all of Nazi Europe. And the inmates used the library a lot. So recording the oral histories of children, or for example, in the diary of Pavel Weiner, he talks about doing research in the library. So, ma'am. Did we miss it, or how old was she when she died? When, she, when Maria, Marianka, when Maria and, and what died? did she do with her life after she got out? And how old was she when she passed away? I'm she's, assuming she's alive. She's still alive. She's oh, still she's, alive. How old is she? She's not. So, she's not so well. She well. She was. She's born in 1923. So that would make her. Kinahara. Yes. She's still here. Oh, okay. I <laughs> yes, thought. I'm yes. sorry. Um, Thank you for asking me about what happened to her afterwards. I only alluded to it when I said that she did not, um, she did not achieve her potential. A uh, highly intelligent woman, she had done well in, at, at school. She yearned for an education. She sought an education after the war. She applied for support from every organization that you can think of but she was an able-bodied woman. So born in 23, she's in her mid twenty, early to mid-20s by the time the war is over, and the um, policy was to put um, um, immigrants, refugees, to work. So here in the United States, the policy was to try to get people to work, if possible, within six months, definitely, within 12 months. So unless there were family, collateral family with resources or friends or someone, education was not possible. 
Marianka and her husband, she married an American, Marianka and her husband ran a chicken farm. And so she ran, had this chicken farm and then her husband died and she felt that she could not uh, handle the chicken farm anymore. This is in upstate New York. And so this woman who had clean, worked in the notions factory and also after those big deportations was detailed to cleaning the toilets and lighting the fires and sweeping the factory floor. That same woman, what did she end up doing the last 10 years of her life? She served as a custodian in the local public school, cleaning the toilets, tending to the heating, and sweeping the floors. Yes? But for Gabs, where is she today if she's alive? And where did she meet her American husband? And did she come to the United States with her uh, mother? Okay. <laughs> Marianka and her mother were not separated at all in their lives. I told about how they were in Berlin, Berlin and then they went to Prague together and so on and so forth. And after the war, still they were together. Um, but then, um, the way this worked is that Marianka and her mother, like many other survivor Jews, were extremely eager to leave formerly Nazi Europe. So they did not wish to stay, they did not wish to return to Germany, not at all, and they did not wish to remain in Czechoslovakia. Marianka, remember, was born in Germany, so for the Czechs, she was post-war Czechs, she was a German, and they didn't want Germans either. So it's kind of complicated situation. Okay, the mother was born in Czechoslovakia, so the mother had Czech citizenship. Um, an opportunity arose for the mother to go to Palestine. And Marianka said to her mother, this is post-war, this is like 46, 47, not immediate, but a year or so, two later, she said to her mother, we've been trying all this time to get out. This is an opportunity. You are older than I. Go. I will find a way. Go. So she, the mom, went first to Italy, from Italy to Palestine. Marianka found a way to get to the United States. So she meets her American, right, okay. Um, however, her great goal was to get her mother back with her. And so it took a year, and a, a year and a half, but she did manage and she brought her mother and the three lived together, Marianka, Marianka's husband and Marianka's mother. Marianka's husband was halfway in age between Marianka and the mom. <laughs> And Marianka said, trust me, it was better that way. <laughs> How did you find her? How did I find her? Um, I found her because, uh, you know, like everything's a story, right? So Marianka had a great, great friend um, in Prague, a childhood friend. And that childhood friend, also Jewish, had made her way to England and survived the war and then returned to Europe, to the continent. Um, Marianka, as you heard, ended up in the United States. So these two women, neither one knew that the other had survived. And these were all those decades before Facebook and email and everything else. And quite by accident, the daughter of that other woman, she realized that Marianka was alive. And she, this daughter, who's my age, she was, a, she has unfortunately died way too young. She 
um, was a professor at the University of Chicago. She knew my work, so she first connected her mother and her mother's great childhood friend. And then she brought me into the mix because she said, you're the person to do this. So, so I um, first got a copy of Marianka's Poesie album, but then I recorded her history. So I went to upstate New York and recorded her history. Please. What yes, you do. <laughs> Just what was she? What was she like, or is she like? I, I know what she's done and how she got here and so forth. What was she like when you spoke with her? Here's a question, for, sort of for you. Did some kind of personality or character emerge from the text that I um, re presented to you? that came from her, that came from her. Yeah. I, th you strong, optimistic, strong-willed, very clear, there's a great deal of clarity um, about what worked and what didn't work and, and about decisions taken and decisions not taken. And that, that I think that is who she is. Um, Remarkably little bitterness. In fact, the the um, of course the Germans get the most when it comes to the bitterness quotient. But the second is that she was not afforded any support to study, and so one of her lessons to me was. Um, as we bring refugees into this country, it's not enough just to land them and settle them and then to tell them to take some crap job, as she would say. Um, if they have potential and if they have wish, it would enrich our society if we enabled them to achieve their potential. Um, you have not had an opportunity, I think, yet, no. and you neither. The drawing, was that her mother's drawing of her? That's pretty good. I mean, if that her mother drew that picture of her washing? Well, her mother was an artist. Oh, her mother, oh, that's the right. The father oh, okay. was a sculptor, and the mom was also an artist. Oh, the father oh, is, is a famous oh, sculptor. Okay, if you, I forgot that. If okay. you, now that we do have Google, Google him and you'll see. So her mother, but once she came to this country, she didn't do any artwork, her mother? I mean, that's something that's universal, artwork. I mean, it, it, the mother also, there are always these details. The mother um, had terrible problems with her eyes and, in fact, was doing this work um, with maybe 20% vision in one eye and maybe 40 or 35 in the other. Um, so, as she would say, her days as an artist were over. The other question came back to me. Did they not receive any compensation from the German government, as some people did? They did get the Wiedergutmachung money, the compensation money they did, but that came much later. And she was um, all, uh, way too late for her to, to study. Ma'am. Had she been exposed to music as a child? Yes, she had been exposed to music as a child. With, uh, first of all, both parents were artists, but those were not necessarily music artists. Um, she says that her father had a great bass baritone voice, and she believes that her father's grandfather was a cantor. She does not know this for certain, but she believes that that's what her father did tell her when she was a child. She also says that he might have been telling her that just, ah, of course I sing, my grandfather was a cantor. So she doesn't know, she just doesn't know. But she had been and she loved it. Ma'am. Uh, what happened to Schechter? He was deported to the east, to Auschwitz, and he was killed. 
so he did not survive. So those yearly meetings in Smetna Hall, they did not occur. I wonder if there's any information about how the performances themselves registered among the Nazi audiences and particularly um, among those Red Cross observers. Is there any, I, I mean, I, I just can't imagine being able to hear this music. And again, because it's reaching into the very depths of the Christian tradition, I, I can't imagine it not creating great dissonance and questioning. So um, I cannot speak to, to what the Germans, the Nazi Germans, and not every German who was in Theresienstadt as a guard or in the administration was actually a member of the Nazi party. So I cannot speak for them. The three members of the delegation, the commission, um, we can't, they did speak about their, their visit, although not too much. And um, you remember I said to you, one wonders what they were thinking, and the answer is they weren't thinking. I also wanted to ask something about the, uh, the, the position of the Red Cross. After the war w was over and the, the heinous activities in the camps became apparent, what excuse did the Red Cross c come up with as to why they were apologists for what was going on in Theresienstadt? There is no evidence at all that they were paid off in any way, shape, or form. No form of bribery, nothing. Um, they, they clearly did not see what they did not want to see. They did not ask questions. Before they came, as you recall, there were, or you may not know, I didn't speak of it, I did not speak of it. There was a beautification campaign. The camp was whitewashed, literally whitewashed. Um, swings were, a swing set was set up. Um, people were dressed nicely, uh, a big um, food spread was laid out. So the Germans extended themselves to show a false face. It was a true Potemkin village. Um, and they came, this delegation of three, they came prepared to believe the Potemkin village. It would have been easy for them to have gone beyond the behind the facade, they didn't. Is this first person type of record being used by those who are writing general histories of Theresen and at the sort of next level, what's it like using one person's, in a sense, kind of diary to try to write a larger history about a place? I assume that they must, scholars find, fragments of individual first-person sources here and there. What's it like to work with something like this to tell the story of a whole city when you have very fragmentary records, I assume, from members who were the, from, from, from prisoners to begin with? It would be a foolish historian indeed who would depend upon only one source or even only one genre of source most particularly if the genre were people from the same segment of society. So um, my, I do work with, I work with oral histories, I work with letters, I work with diaries. As I tell my students, you know what I do for a living? I read other people's mail and private papers for a living. Um, so I, I do use those. I use them together with a range of other sources. And, and there are a range of other sources. So there is a whole memorial camp at Terezin um, with a huge archive. Um, the Germans did not destroy a lot of the papers, unlike Auschwitz, for example. The Germans destroyed the entire archive at Auschwitz. They simply forgot to destroy the building department archive, this is at Auschwitz now, 
with only because it was some meters down the road, and they just forgot about it. And that was very lucky for my co-author and me, because if form followed function, then we could follow the development of the camp and the Germans thinking about the camp from the building archive records. You're with me so far? But they did not do that for Terezin. So there actually are a lot of records. So there are records, there are diaries, paintings, hundreds and hundreds of paintings. Paintings were um, hidden in the walls. These are, uh, this was a garrison town. These walls are like a meter thick. So, um, so paintings could be hidden literally in scooped out portions of the walls. So hundreds of paintings um, which depict what daily, reality, what daily life was like, what the reality of Terezin was like. So there's a rich range of sources to reconstruct the history of the camp and the social, cultural, political, intellectual life of that camp. Can you tell us what the term poesie is that you're using? Sorry, I'm very sorry. Poesie, it's poem, but it's like an autograph album. Like here in the United States, we call them autograph albums. Um, and um, even, even though young, mostly it's kids who do it, even though they don't just sign their name, you know, roses are red, violets are blue, whatever. Um, so the German term was this poesie album, this poem album. So they don't call it an autograph album, but a poem album. And they did do these little poems and you know, stay as lovely as you are and don't forget me and things of that nature. I, I know that the focus here has been primarily on the Requiem, but I actually visited Theresen a few years ago, and you know it's um, unbelievable and amazing. Um, but one of the things that I was fascinated with was the children's opera, the Brundabar, you know, and actually that's been on TV, and I wondered if any of the people that you talked to or knew about was connected to that opera. I mean, that's such an amazing feat, you know, under the circumstances. One of the most famous productions uh, in Terezin was a children's opera, Brundibar. And so, um, and you, you mentioned that there, it, there was a film about it which was on TV relatively recently. Most of the people who signed Marianka's album were not of that age range. They were a register older. So they were involved with training the children, listening to them do their parts, but not in the production itself. I have also worked on another diary. This was of Pavel Weiner, which Tom mentioned at the beginning. And he was the, he was the right age for Brundibar. He was 13. Um, he wrote this diary during his bar mitzvah year and talks about the day when he would have been bar mitzvah, but wasn't um, because they were in Terezin. But anyway, back to the point. So there's more about Brundibar there than in Marianka's album. I'm fascinated how the singers learned their music. Some of them didn't know it when they got there. Did she talk about that with you? Oh, she talked about that at length. She talked about um, how they were divided into small groups and who would teach them. So Carol Berman was one of her um, masters and how they, even though it's not, a, it's not the same register, of course, but still these professional singers were teaching the choristers in small groups, no score, so it's all from memory, but she talked about that at length and about how it was over, repetition over and over and over again, but also that these masters, as they called them, were um, perfectionists. She said, just don't think for a second that because we were in that camp, we didn't have to hold the line. This was 
a professional performance. And again, it's this piece that I was mentioning to you about living life on two levels. So with one part of their brains and thoughts and commitment and energy, they were striving to do an utterly professional performance. And with another part, they were wondering where was going to be the next scrap of food to eat. So on that note, I wish you all a nice snack.